I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to tell you about some of our work on engineering by energy crops for reduced calcitrons and fiber accumulation. So we're doing this work at the Joint Brain Energy Institute, which is a big uh, project where we are trying to establish scientific knowledge and new technologies to uh, find out how we can convert uh, lignocellular cellulose biomass into biofuels and byproducts. And we are several institutions involved in this work, and you can see here in this map. Uh, but regardless of institutional affiliation, most of us are working in this uh, site in Emeryville outside Berkeley in California. We are working on the whole uh, process from feedstocks development to deconstruction of the biomass into <laughs> sugars and lignin derived intermediates, and also a conversion of these uh, compounds into biofuels and byproducts using engineered uh, microorganisms, especially Pseudomonas pupida. Uh, in the feedstocks uh, part of the work, the main challenge is that biomass is really difficult to deconstruct uh, and take into these uh, sugars and lignin derived intermediates. And we don't have very good uh, predictive tools for rational engineering of bioenergy crops. Uh, finally, it's not enough that we engineer these bioenergy crops so that they will have a good composition for the downstream processing. It's also important uh, that these bioenergy crops are resilient to environmental stress and, and disease. So we set these goals for the feedstocks uh, work in JBA. We want to develop fundamental understanding of cell wall biology. We developing tools to facilitate bioenergy crop improvement, and we are engineering bioenergy crops and sorghum, poplar, and switchgrass with traits for improved biomass and biofuels <coughs> and sustainability traits. Uh, finally, we are field testing these crops uh, with. Uh, to ensure that the traits are properly expressed uh, in the field. So we are many people involved in this work and I, I will not be able to acknowledge everybody individually who's been involved in the work, but this shows the leadership in feedstocks and almost everybody uh, uh, shown here has been involved in the work. So we have several strategies to improve recalcitrants. Uh, of uh, plant biomass. And I'll talk a lot about this uh, QSUB gene, which is a gene encoding a dehydrogenate dehydratase that converts a precursor of lignin biosynthesis into protocategoric acid. And by doing that, we can decrease lignin. So we've done that in sorghum, poplar, and switchgrass. And we have other traits here, for example, is AT10 in this and acyl transferase. And it results in an increase in the ratio between chimeric acid and ferulic acid. And since ferulic acid is involved in cross linking of cell walls and grasses, it can also give less recalcitrance. And then we have some other strategies that I will not really talk about. So we developed these traits initially in model plants and rice and in apidopsis, and we've inserted them in different crops, including uh, switch grasses shown here. So with the ferulic acid uh, in these AT10 plants, you can see that we have, as I said, an increased chromatic acid, ferulic acid ratio. And in both leaves and stems, when we sacrifice the biomass, we get more sugars out. For QSUB, we have several different lines. All of them have less lignin than the control lines. And when we sacrifice the biomass, we found that there was more sugar released in these lines. So based on these results from greenhouse studies, we wanted to see how these uh, plants would perform in the field. So we selected three lines from the QSUB uh, set here, uh, and the two lines that we had for the ACE transferase to test in the field. We planted them in Davis, California in 2017, and <clears throat> that was the first year the plants got established. And then we had three full years of yield data for the subsequent years. Um, and in each year we harvested three times, and you can see here the yield data that we obtained. So there are many things you can see here. You can see in the second year, we got better yields than in the first year. That is typical with a perennial plant like switchgrass. It needs to be established and you get more yield in the second year. You can also see that we have less yield in the third year, which is also typically seen with switchgrass that after some years, the yield decrease. Uh, but of course, the, the yield in each individual year also depends on the weather and, and pathogen conditions in that particular year. Now, you can also see that generally the QSUB plants have a higher yield. Uh, and over the, all the three years, you can see that uh, 
that is true for all the three lines. The best line here gets 16% uh, yield, better yield over all the three years. The fruitic acid transfers or the lower ferulic acid plants here, they, this line is underperforming. So there's something with that line, the other one has yields like the control plants. Now, we also looked at lignin and I'm not showing the data. We did find a decrease in lignin in the QSUP plants like we had seen in the greenhouse, but the uh, effect was much smaller. So we, we saw a decrease in lignin, but not that much as we had expected. But then on the other hand, we saw this increase in yield. So it's not, the first time that people have observed different uh, results in the field experiment that they've got in the greenhouse, but we want to try to understand what it is that is going on. So we've been uh, acquiring transcriptomic and metabolomic data from plants grown out of both conditions. And you can see here with the transcriptomic data uh, that when we analyze that data, we do find that the genotype is the most important factor. So the uh, control plants are more similar to each other regardless of where they were grown than to the QSUB <coughs> plants. You can also see that the QSUB plants, the three line, different lines, they're all quite similar. So we, in this sense, we didn't need three individual lines in this experiment. Uh, for the metabolomics, however, the result is different. The main factor that, that uh, separates the data here is the growth location. So uh, the plants grown in the greenhouse are more similar to each other in terms of metabolomics, regardless of the genotype, uh, than the plants grown in the field and vice versa. So we hope that this analysis, that we were still in the process of analyzing this data, and we hope it will help us to understand the, the differences in the environmental impact that, that uh, causes these uh, results, and that way we can be more predictive about our engineering. So we saw the better yield in the QSUB plants, and that was, of course, very nice. Uh, I don't think necessarily the plants were drought stressed because we irrigated the plants. But on the other hand, we had this result from our uh, plants where we have put QSUB in our pitopsis. Uh, and whether we have QSUB alone or stacked together with some other traits, we always saw that these plants are substantially more drought tolerant than the control plants. So we don't know if this is true for the bioenergy crops that we put this trait in. Uh, but we thought it was uh, interesting enough that we wanted to make a bigger experiment with switchgrass, uh, including another site. So we have the Davis site, which is the same place as the other field I showed results from. And then we have a second site down here in Kearney in the Central Valley. And they're different soil types. The soil is more sandy down in Kearney. And then we took uh, half of the plants and gave them full irrigation, uh, according to calculated evapotranspiration. And then the other plants only had half uh, the input of, of the uh, fully uh, irrigated plants. And we planted them in 2019. And we got the full year of yield data. Um, that I'm, I'm showing here. So again, we harvested three times. So I'm just showing the sum for the whole uh, year. I'm also not showing a statistical analysis because it's still a bit preliminary, but you can see many things here. You can see that uh, the yields in Davies are higher than in Kearney in overall. You can see that the QHB plants are doing really well in Davies. They're also doing better in Kearney, but the difference is smaller. Uh, you can see that uh, when we have less input, we get less yield as one would expect. But the effect is overall much bigger on the sandy uh, soil in Kearney where there's less water holding capacity. And then we seem to see that in QHB 10 line, at least, that the decrease in yield with less input is less severe than in the control plants on these uh, other lines. And that is true in both locations. And whether this holds up uh, in, in subsequent years, we still remains to be seen. And we are also doing greenhouse experiments to see if these plants are really drought tolerant uh, the same way we saw in Arpidopsis. Now we can make plants that are less recalcitrant I've shown you here, but we can also take this protocatechoic acid that is made uh, with the dehydrochigamate dehydratase and convert it to byproducts such as muconic acid or pyron dicarboxylic acid, which is a precursor for uh, biodegradable plastic. So that is uh, very interesting for us. Now, if you want to make byproduct, we want to make a lot of byproducts, so we don't want to just take dehydrochigamate at the endogenous normal levels. We want to actually boost the pathway uh, and then uh, make as much byproduct as possible. And I'll show you how you do that. But first, we have to think about what byproducts should we make. And we've been working together with uh, 
uh, the techno-economic analysis team led by Corinne Scown and JB to try to see how much byproduct should you make for it to be economically viable. So they have a model of a biorefinery. And then, of course, the more valuable the byproduct, the less you need to make. Um, but if you're making like bulk chemicals that would be more relevant in bioenergy crops, uh, we typically need around uh, uh, no, maybe half a percent uh, to break even. And if we can make uh, one or two percent of a, of a byproduct, it would be quite uh, economically feasible according to these calculations. Um, the model also uh, enables uh, looking at uh, and comparing producing a byproduct in plant or producing a byproduct in microbial system. Because many of these byproducts, we could make the same product in the plant, or we could take sugars from the plant and convert that using a microbe to the same byproduct. And then we can kind of calculate under which conditions is it more beneficial to use the plant or under which conditions would it be more beneficial to use a microbial system. So this just shows a few results. I will not go into too much detail. We'll hear more about it in uh, Emmerich's talk in session nine. But you can see here how when we added this ROG gene to boost the pathway, we get a lot more uh, protocatechoic acid. This is in our autopsy. So this is for QHUB alone. We just have a little. But if we to put in the ROG gene, we get a lot up to 4.5% of the dry uh, weight is now um, protocatechoic acid. And if we add these other genes for PDC uh, production, we can make uh, up to 2.5% uh, of the biomass as uh, PDC. We are in the process of putting these traits in sorghum, uh, but most of that work is, is, is in progress. Uh, but I do have some results here. Uh, that uh, So these sorghum plants were made in collaboration with Albert Kalch in the University of Rhode Island. You can see some of the plants here. These plants are producing 4-hydroxy benzoic acid, uh, and uh, they produce uh, up to 0.4%. Uh, we also have some other plants here that are producing cell wall bound uh, paracumerate, which is uh, naturally present in plants, but we can make more of it in, in these plants. And we have uh, taken some of the biomass from these plants here and given to our colleagues in JBay uh, who had done deconstruction using ionic liquid pretreatment and enzymatic sacrification, and then used an engineered rhodosporidium toroidis to produce bisapoline, which is a jet fuel. Precursor, and you can see here that biomass from these plants that have, that produce 4-hydroxybenzoic acid in the biomass, they actually uh, result in quite a big 20% uh, increase in bisaccharide production in, in the end. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and I want to thank everybody uh, in the JBay teams and in. With, with our collaborators for, for all the work they put into this uh, and, and thank for your attention. Hello everyone, my name is Hugo Molinari. I'm from Embrapa Agroenergy, located in Brazil, and the title of my presentation is New Biotechnology Traits for Sugarcane. Now I will present the research and development project in sugarcane that we are developing uh, with partnership with different uh, institutions. Here in this presentation, I will focus in the industry demand for sucrose, varieties with sucrose improvement. Uh, here you can see uh, the market size for this trade. It's about $3 billion. And for this project to generate varieties with more sucrose accumulation, we have a partnership with CTC. The second uh, trait that we are developing in partnership with CTC also is aluminum tolerance. And the market size for this uh, trait is about one to two billion dollars. Uh, also, you can see here a technological maturity level. Uh, this scale, uh, it's important to put this uh, trait in a in a maturity level scale. For example, the sugar, the, the sucrose trait is in the uh, scale five and, and the, the aluminum tolerance in scale four. Here I can, uh, I need more uh, tests and, and the sucrose are more advanced in the scale to reach the market.
Um, here I will present uh, the scenario for sugarcane improvement uh, using uh, new breeding technologies. Uh, the current scenario for sugarcane uh, is to produce sugar. The sugar uh, is used to produce ethanol and food for industry. And the bagasse is used to cogenerate energy. But this scenario is changing very fast. And now we have different varieties. The first variety developed by CTC is varieties resistant to insect to borer. But uh, it's possible to generate different varieties. Uh, for example, sugarcane, energy cane, uh, adapted to climate, uh, climate change, uh, using new technologies, uh, for example, CRISPR-Cas technologies, to produce edited varieties, new varieties with modified sugar to industry, the production of biomaterials, 2D ethanol production, and uh, in this sense, we develop a new trait named flex cane. Our first uh, variety for sucrose accumulation. To get this variety, uh, we are working for more than 10 years with these genes a bad acyl transferase. This bad acyl transferase is genes involved in ferulation of uh, hemicellulose, arabino xylem, in grass cell walls. We identified five bad genes uh, in the genome of sugarcane, we select, and we selected two genes. The first gene is named bad one, and is involved in increased biomass digestibility. It's very, this gene is very important for a 2D ethanol production. The second gene is BAD5, that the gene uh, is the focus of my presentation here. And this gene is involved in increasing sucrose accumulation. Uh, we first observe the suppression of this gene is Interestingly, uh, we observe a sucrose accumulation in the, in the tissues. For example, you can see here in the leaves, uh, we, uh, we observe more than 50% of increase of this sugar uh, and more than 96% uh, in stocks. We publish different papers demonstrating the role of these genes. Uh, in, uh, in a model plant, Cetaria burites. And here it's, uh, I present an overview of new propanoids and mon monolignol pathways showing this specific this gene, the BAD5 gene, uh, involved uh, in the, in the comaruluation uh, of, uh, of these po polymers. And this uh, gene have a putative uh, role in, in PECOMARUCOA transferase. But we, uh, we don't know in the moment it, the specific role that these genes uh, in, the, in the sugar cane or in the grasses involved in sucrose accumulation. Now we are trying to understand how these genes work to get this interesting result in sucrose accumulation in cetara virides as a model plant and also in sugarcane that is our main crop. Uh, here is more in more detail results uh, that we observe by metabolomics analysis. We first observe, observe increasing sucrose content uh, using a metabolic profile and the, and the sugar cane, in this analysis, the main discriminant metabolite in BAD5 events. We reach uh, in, in combs nine, more than 96%, as you can see here. This uh, is very consistent uh, result because we have these results in different events, as you can see here. Uh, when you silence uh, this, this gene in in leaves, in, in stems, in, 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 in the roots. Then, these very interesting results, when you see these very interesting results in a model plant, Cetara virides, 
we uh, we go find uh, the ortholog of in sugarcane and we silence uh, this gene and you see the same results as you can see here we have 17 percent increase in fresh stock weight comparing to the non transformed plants this is consistent in two different independent events here in sugarcane also we have in, in uh, increment uh, of other sugars as a glucose fructose but the main sugar that uh, is the focus of this our technology is the sucrose here also we measure uh, the sucrose in uh, in a juice and you and you see again a uh, 15 percent increase in 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 sucrose but also we can see uh, increase in the other sugars and glucose and fructose uh, we tested also in leaves the sacrification of uh, of uh, we use leaves of the sugarcane plants from these two events and we uh, we observe uh, increase in sacrification in release of glucose in untreated biomass in six hours and also in 48 hours in plants with 11 months. Our second gene uh, that I mentioned in previous uh, slides is a gene related in aluminum tolerance. The gene that we use for this is a, uh, the name is MATE. It's involved in citrate exudation of in the roots. As you can see here, uh, a very clear uh, roots in a, it tested in a, a hydroponic system with uh, uh, more than uh, 500 micromolar of aluminum and free aluminum in the, in the, in the in this system. Uh, here is in this in this picture is, you can see uh, more purple uh, staining uh, in this metoxylene root staining. Uh, the roots of of no transformed plants here you can see, and uh, in the both events here, a transform event overexpress in this gene. Uh, that exudate citrate from the median, uh, the aluminum is not enter in the roots and not cause this this type of, of problem, and the roots develop normally in in the in the in the median. Uh, here is you can see the increase of, of uh, fourteen percent in in malic acid and also in citric acid more than uh, forty percent. Uh, these events. Sucrose, uh, the, the events for sucrose accumulation and also aluminum to, uh, uh, tolerance is testing in two different areas that we have here at uh, Embrapa Agri Energy in Brasilia. We have one, one uh, field test uh, with 40.5 hectares and another one with about one hectare uh, here at Embrapa Agro Energy for, to test uh, different traits. But to test, specifically to test for aluminum tolerance, uh, Embrapa maize and sorghum have a, a, a specific a specific field uh, for phenotyping this type of uh, trait. Uh, this site is very interesting because have a gradient of aluminum, natural aluminum in the soil that uh, it's possible to test side by side the the events for aluminum tolerance. It's very nice. Uh, this is our partners from from other institutes, from other uh, for other embrapas, uh, the the funding agencies that uh, uh, work with with us to funding our project, and our partner in the sugarcane breeding and uh, sugarcane sector. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. My name is Mauricio Antunes, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences and the Biodiscovery Institute at the University of North Texas uh, in the United States. So today I'll tell you a little bit about uh, efforts in my lab to engineer what we call dynamic control uh, of secondary metabolism in plants. So as you know, plant secondary or specialized metabolism uh, provides us with many useful compounds, such as a variety of uh, pharmaceutical compounds, natural flavoring agents, dyes and fragrances, and even uh, fuels. So uh, these compounds are all produced by different metabolic pathways in the plant. Uh, 
many of those uh, are considered uh, specialized pathways, such as the phenylpropanoids, uh, terpenoids, and, and others. Um, and many of these compounds are also very difficult to be synthesized chemically uh, in the lab. So my lab is interested in, in <clears throat> uh, engineering and improving some of these pathways so we can more efficiently produce uh, these compounds uh, in plants. So uh, the approach that we take in my lab is, is a synthetic biology approach where uh, we develop uh, systems to rewire or redirect the metabolic flux in these pathways and also uh, try to obtain a more quantitative control of the flux in these pathways so we can produce these natural products more efficiently. Uh, what we also hope to do is, in addition to producing these uh, natural products, is that we learn a thing or two uh, in the process about uh, natural, the natural regulation of these uh, metabolic pathways. So uh, what do I mean by dynamic control of these pathways? So think of this uh, sort of like the cruise control in your car. So in that type of system, of control system, uh, you set the speed uh, for the car to travel. And if the car, for example, starts going up a hill and the speed start, starts to drop, the system kicks in to uh, <clears throat> provide more power to the car so it can go back to that uh, originally set uh, speed. So this is what more or less what we're trying to do with these metabolic pathways. And again, focusing on secondary metabolism, uh, and the example that I'm showing you here uh, is the phenylpropanoid pathway it starts uh, starting with uh, the amino acid phenylalanine, and it provides many useful compounds. Uh, the, this branch produces lignin, uh, and another branch of the pathway produces a variety of different flavonoids with many uh, uh, of these with pharmaceutical uh, importance. So uh, in this uh, type of dynamic control system, uh, we develop these uh, uh, genetically encoded uh, systems that are able to monitor the levels of certain key metabolites of, these, of this pathway. And depending on the, the levels of these metabolites, the system will automatically uh, control the flux of these of the different metabolites through different branches uh, of the pathway. And uh, the system that we develop is uh, focused more on transcriptional regulation of uh, key enzymes uh, in this pathway. So uh, uh, depending on the levels of, again, of these uh, chemicals, these, these metabolites, uh, the system can uh, redirect the flux of metabolites through uh, specific branches of the pathway. All right, so these uh, controllable biological processors, as we call them, uh, they function similarly to their uh, electronic counterparts. That is, uh, they're able to uh, sense or receive different types of inputs, uh, and then they will process or integrate those inputs and according to predefined rules for, for the, this uh, information processing, uh, the system will produce or not an output, okay? So in our genetically encoded system, uh, we take advantage of uh, sensor proteins that we introduce into the plant, and those sensor proteins then can monitor the levels of specific uh, metabolites of the different pathways. And then multiple sensor proteins will then provide the input to uh, the processing part of this uh, genetically encoded uh, processing circuit. And that information will be integrated. Uh, and then depending on the presence or absence of these inputs, uh, an output uh, or a trait uh, will be uh, produced. So in our lab, we uh, work on uh, all three components of this, uh, these biological processors, and I'll tell you a little bit about these uh, today. So uh, I'll tell you uh, some efforts that we've uh, had in terms of developing the, the sensor proteins for uh, detecting the levels and the changing levels of these uh, key metabolites. Uh, I'll give you an example of one regulatory device, a Boolean logic operator uh, that we have developed. And then uh, I'm, with, I'm not gonna have time to talk about the response and how we uh, uh, redirect the flux uh, in these pathways. But again, it, it's focused on transcriptional regulation 
of uh, key enzymes in these pathways. Okay, so uh, the sensing component of these biological processors, um, uh, we use uh, different types of sensor proteins. Uh, the one I'm gonna show you now uh, uses uh, adapter sensor proteins that are natural uh, sensors in, in bacteria. And in bacteria, these proteins uh, function as transcriptional repressors, okay? So uh, in the absence of the, 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 the ligand or, or the metabolite that these proteins sense, uh, these function as transcriptional repressors. They bind to DNA to, in a promoter region of, of a gene, and they repress expression or repress transcription uh, of that gene. And uh, we've been working on different types of sensors, uh, sensor proteins. Uh, and most recently, we have sensors to Coumaryl-CoA, malonyl-CoA, naringenin, and ferulic acid, and all these uh, com compounds are part of the phenylpropanoid pathway in plants. So as I said, these transcription factors, they function as transcriptional repressors. In the absence of the ligand, uh, they bind to the promoter and repress transcription. Uh, when the ligand is present, uh, it, it interacts with the, the, the sensor protein and causes a conformational change that, that causes the, the transcription repressor to, uh, to dissociate from the promoter and transcription of a downstream gene uh, is initiated. So uh, we engineer these systems uh, to function in plants, so we adapt them from, from, from their bacterial uh, uh, original uh, environment to function in plants and then we determine their uh, input output curves uh, to determine how much uh, uh, of the ligand is necessary to initiate uh, tra uh, transcription of a downstream gene. So I'll show you a couple of examples here. So uh, one important thing that we need to, to, to have is uh, to achieve what we call the off state. So these are transcriptional repressors. And so uh, in the absence of the ligand, we want to have a very tight uh, off state. So no transcription uh, of, uh, from that promoter. And so here are some examples of the Coumaryl-CoA sensor, the myelonyl-CoA, and the Ringenin. And in some cases, uh, we're still working on improving the Coumaryl-CoA sensor, but in some cases, we get up to 97, 98% repression uh, compared to a control uh, in the absence of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the transcriptional repressor or the sensor protein. Okay, so uh, when this sensor protein is present and no ligand is present, uh, we have almost 100% uh, repression of the promoter. Now, this is not enough. Uh, the off state is not enough. We need to also switch from off to on when the, the specific ligand or metabolite is present. And so we've been able to show that uh, when we start adding, in this case, the, uh, the metabolite is naringenin, with increasing concentrations of, of naringenin, we derepress or we activate uh, the promoter uh, in expression uh, of a uh, reporter gene. Okay. Uh, another approach that we, uh, we've taken and, and we've published on this uh, a few years ago, uh, this was uh, work in collaboration uh, with David Baker's lab at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, uh, his lab does uh, computational uh, engineering of proteins. And in this work that we published together, uh, his lab uh, was able to uh, computationally modify the, the ligand binding site of a protein to uh, change its specificity of ligand binding uh, to uh, recognize and, and, and bind uh, digoxin or digoxygenin. So the, this is a, a cardiac glycoside produced by, not naturally produced by foxglove plants. Um, and, and it's used as a heart medication and uh, the, the current supply of digoxin uh, for uh, heart uh, treatment is uh, all derived from extraction from foxglove plants. So uh, we collaborated again with uh, the Baker lab and, and they computationally engineered a ligand binding protein domain to recognize specifically digoxin or digoxygenin, the aglycone form of digoxin. And then we fused a DNA binding domain and a transcriptional activation domain 
to this engineered, computationally engineered ligand binding domain. And we took advantage of the instability of this design protein in the absence of that, uh, that ligand of digoxin. And uh, in the presence of digoxin or the, its ligand, this protein is stabilized, okay? And it starts accumulating inside the cell. Then uh, the DNA binding domain attached to this ligand binding domain directs the protein to uh, a, a sequence in the promoter of a gene and it can activate uh, transcription. Okay, so uh, this is uh, stability dependent uh, transcriptional activation. The, the protein becomes more stable in the presence of the ligand. And again, this uh, is published work that we published a few years ago. Uh, we showed that this system works in plants, uh, so we transformed this into uh, Arabidopsis plants and showed that in the absence of the, the ligand, in this case digoxygenin, uh, uh, we have very tight control uh, of the, the promoter, the expression from the promoter. Now in the presence of digoxygenin, we had significant activation uh, uh, of expression of a reporter gene, in this case uh, luciferase. Uh, we showed that the system uh, has a, a nice dose response, uh, and it's fairly specific. Uh, digoxygenin is, is by far the best activator uh, of this system, and uh, related uh, compounds don't activate it nearly as well. Okay, so that's uh, for the sensing uh, part of the, the, these controllable uh, processors. Uh, Again, the, this information uh, provided by these sensor proteins needs to be integrated. So multiple sensors providing input, uh, the, this information needs to be uh, processed. And the, one, one part of the processor uh, is uh, provided by what we call Boolean logic gates. So again, these are genetically encoded uh, uh, devices that can perform this type of computation, uh, Boolean logic uh, operations. And to do this, uh, we've taken advantage uh, of uh, synthetic peptides uh, that form heterodimers. Uh, these are coiled coiled peptides that form heterodimers. And so uh, we've taken advantage of this uh, by fusing one member of the, of the dimer or one monomer to a DNA binding domain and another monomer to a transcriptional activation domain. And when these, uh, both of these uh, uh, proteins are present, then uh, they reconstitute a transcriptional activator that can then bind to a promoter and uh, activate uh, a reporter gene. So this is the, the, the representat representation of this Boolean AND logic gate. So uh, in the presence of input one and input two, both of these proteins are then present, interact, and they can activate uh, expression of a downstream gene. So this is the, the truth table for, uh, that represents the a Boolean AND logic operation. And as you can see, uh, you can only uh, pr produce an output when both input one and input two are present. And so we've tested this system. Uh, again, we're still improving this system, but if we only have the promoter, we have very low levels of uh, uh, luciferase uh, production. Uh, if we only have uh, the DNA binding domain or the transcriptional activation domain, we get very low levels of activation. And different combinations uh, of, this, uh, of these two components uh, provides much higher levels of activation of the promoter. So uh, back to the, the controllable biological processors, uh, I've showed you some uh, results in terms of uh, sensor proteins that we use to sense the levels of different metabolites inside the, the plant, inside the cell, and then provide the input to uh, biological uh, processors, uh, these regulatory devices that can then integrate the information from the sensors and then uh, produce some sort of response. And in this case is to redirect the flux of metabolites uh, through the different branches uh, of the pathway. All right, so uh, I'll just uh, stop here and, and then acknowledge people that, that have helped along the way to, to do this, this, all this work. 
uh, I was previously at Colorado State University, and these are the people that, that helped uh, with some of the work that I showed you here. Uh, my lab at, at UNT, uh, I have a postdoc, Savio Fajera, who's done uh, a lot of the work on the sensor proteins. Uh, a graduate student of mine, Charles Anderson, uh, has done the work on the Boolean and logic gate. And I, I wasn't able to show you uh, some work for, uh, by uh, Stephanie uh, and Trina, also in my lab. Uh, collaborations uh, with June Medford and Ashok Prasad at Colorado State University. I showed you a little bit of work uh, that we did in collaboration with David Baker uh, and, and some collaboration with Ron Weiss as well. And I'd like to acknowledge the funding uh, from the funding agencies. Uh, thank you very much. Hi, my name is Paulo Cesar de Luca. I'm the CEO of Panjai Biotech. You are a plant transformation facility and you work with genetic engineering, sure can breathing. So when you see the genetic engineering US uh, from 0% until 95%, uh, the adoption uh, spend less than 20 years. Uh, Brazil is the second uh, market in the world. And the 100% of this technology was created in other countries. Uh, and you see the, the uh, before biotech in soybean, after biotech, and you see a huge difference. The, the production increases a lot. And the, uh, you still see in sugarcane uh, soil erosion, you still see in sugarcane a high use of insecticides to pest control. So it uh, exists a huge delay in the application of biotech in sugarcane. Uh, so sugarcane is different for other crops. Uh, you, you don't have seeds. Uh, you need to transform it variety per variety from cells until the whole plants. So this process is not easy. Each variety, variety has a specific way to get events. So in corn, soybean, and cotton, you transform a mode of variety, then you transfer the genes, the transgenes, for other genotypes through pronunciation. So in sugar can, you cannot do this. This makes the process completely different. Uh, so you are a plant transformation facility, you are incubated at Unicamp since 2015. You receive DNA and you deliver plants. So uh, in four years, you, you send more than 150 different sugarcane, corn, tobacco, and tomato for uh, 25 research institutions uh, that Pangea uh, already uh, makes plants. So you also has a, a customer in Mexico. So uh, besides the, the service of the plant transformation, in 2017, you, you have an agreement with Embrapa to produce uh, sugarcane varieties with glyphosate and water resistance uh, for this pest. Uh, just to remember that in corn and soybean, they, uh, they used biotech for weed and sack pest control since 1995. So you are 26 years in the lay in sugarcane. You have support from Sobrai and Imbrapi. So uh, basically you have five steps from construction to the market. Basically you need to have the DNA, you need to do transformation, you need to, to to do the molecular field strays, the regulatory, and the, finally, you need to do the commercialization and make money. Uh, so you share the, 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 the steps, and the, the knowledge in Pajaya is mainly to, to build a DNA cassettes for traits, and also do the transformation. And the Embrapa, um, made the, the molecular and field strayers uh, besides the regulatory. And now you are looking for new partners to make the commercialization step. Uh, so you need to have the best traits, but in the best varieties. Uh, and to assess the best varieties, you make some agreements with HIDES and the IAC. You see here the top 20 varieties, and the, 
uh, nowadays in, in our current portfolio, you are already transformed six of these 20 varieties, and the, the goal for this year is more free varieties. So in, the, in December of 2021, you are going to have nine from tw top 20 varieties with our technology. So the results to ta are still in 2017, uh, you got the first events, uh, you make some uh, uh, tests, basically here the a piece of leaf, then the, here you have the the are uh, high level okay, protein expressions, uh, three different genes, one to lymphocyte uh, resistance, and the two for bottle resistance. It's two different cry genes that uh, has different uh, system in the past to control. So here, our plants uh, in the greenhouse, you basically test, uh, spray hand up in our plants, and they are making infestation with the border. And then here you have our events that also is resistance for the hand up uh, and uh, resistance to border infestation. So 100% of the DNA technology belongs to Pangea Biotech. Uh, so uh, 2019, uh, so I sent the plants to the Embrapa. Now the Embrapa produced the second regeneration and they test the, 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 the plants uh, with four times the commercial concentration of glyphosate. And here you can see the difference between uh, the control and the, the events. Also makes the test with uh, border challenger. Uh, and you see here the what type control and the here event. So the insects that just eat a piece of the leaf and diet. And here you can see the stock completely uh, uh, intact. And here you see how how the problem is is big. So Embrapa uh, makes the uh, first field test with uh, free uh, elite events. Then they choose the best one, the elite event. Now you, don't, uh, you are doing the last field trails to to produce a dossier to send to Cetanville to get permission to start the commercialization. So, uh, more two years, you are going to, to uh, start the commercial planting. Here you can see the a publication, the, the Panjaya Nibrapa, the first variety in the world that is uh, also resistance for water and glyphosate uh, uh, glyphosate. So, it's just the beginning. Uh, new traits are coming, so nowadays the huge problem in sugar cane is this insect, is a coleoptero. There is no chemical uh, or biological control, and the, now uh, you include the other Embrapa, this other center of Embrapa, then they, uh, they, they are going to insert uh, the the SNF lab is resistance for the previous technology. So uh, I already had five commercial uh, varieties transformed in greenhousing, been testing uh, of the the SNF labs attacked. Beside this insect control, uh, you you are looking for drought tolerance, but not just testing the genes. You already got a commercial, a commercial gene that is already worked in other crops. And you, you are going to introduce this for the previous traits, uh, glyphosate uh, resistance, bottle resistance, snuff resistance, plus uh, the tolerance for drop. Uh, you, are, you believe that the, the production, you increase between 10 to 25%. So uh, you need to remember that the sugar can stay during the whole year in the, 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 the field. And the, all year you have two, three, four months with hydric stress. So it's really, really, really important drug tolerance to sugar cane. Uh, also, you are looking for disease. This is a leafy scout disease, it's very important. Now you have other Embrapa uh, Center together and they already produce the plants and send to them. 
uh, to test if it works or not. All, all the genes that you have, you, that you tested, you send to the, the sequence, you send to the uh, prof some professionals and they study if he, you can use a, this DNA for final commercialization, if you are going to have problems with other comps or not. And the result that you watch is that all the sequence is FTO, freedom to operate. This is very, very important. So the Pangea has two big knowledge. Besides the sugar cane transformation process, you also understand uh, to, to build the construction with many, many genes. Here, for example, the Senoff Levis construction is five genes. And you know how to do the design and to how the genes really have a high expression. And the, beside the, in the same tDNA, five genes, beside this, you are going to introduce here draw tolerance, this is called resistance, and the second we see resistance. So until the end of this year, I reach a tDNA with eight different genes in the same tDNA. To introduce the plant, you know what to do, sure. Uh, now you need to, how, to, how works a lot of genes, how works the integration of promoters. This is, this is a very amazing study. So our, uh, our job is people are looking for, uh, here in the very uh, important newspaper in Brazil, they talk about Embrapa and the Pyangea Biotech. Uh, here, the leader of the uh, government, Agriculture Federal, comment. Uh, she, she talked about it and say that uh, a very cheap price to produce uh, uh, plant, uh, transgenic plants. So this is very good for us. So our team, uh, I'm Paulo Sérgio de Luca, I'm founder, founder of the Pangea. 23 years uh, I had worked with plant transformation. Uh, part of this year, 13 years in three different private companies. I have four IP in sugar cane transformation. I have a partner, Mr. Amir Zanka. He had worked 12 years at Monsanto just during the design of gene construction. I have a friend, Dr. John Key, is our consultor in the US. The team in total is 10 staff, mainly is uh, Unicamp students. So what you is our achievement right now, up to now? You have a FTO sugar can, uh, transformation process. You have a G, uh, cassettes that is a, a very important traits that is FTO. You have agreement with Unicamp, with Papesp, Embrapa, uh, IAC, and Hidesa. This is very huge uh, institutions. You have up to now six commercial varieties transformed, which four is between top 10 more planted on nowadays. You have a thing and the uh, facility uh, that works very well. And nowadays we are open for investors. The goals. Uh, First commercial variety, uh, more two years or three. Then you're going to, to send it to the, 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 the field at least three new varieties per year to get a, a, a big portfolio. And uh, more 10 years, at least 20% of the total area. That means uh, two millions of hectares. Uh, we wish a, a very cheap price for the farmers just 16 60 uh, dollars per hectare per year they save it using our technology at least uh 500 dollars per hectare at least uh and this means that you are going to 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 get uh, to make 120 million dollars per year and you are looking for investors so you have a lot of support uh in brapa in nova unicamp sebrae Grupo Idea in Camp, mainly from FAPESP, and you are incubated in, L, in this lab at Unicamp. So, uh, I'm very proud about the uh, about FAPESP. Uh, you, are the, 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 you are born from 
a, a project, PIP project that a FAPES approved in August of 2015. Uh, so, finally, you are bringing biotech to sugarcane. It's, it's a very huge delay, but it, you, you get. Thank you a lot.